morning. We are back in person. Woo! I should not yell into the microphone. Who gave me this thing? Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you helped yourself to coffee and pastries. If you haven't, grab some on the way home. Um, I think there's plenty. Uh, so I'm Corey Price. If you don't know me, I'm the host of Creative Morning Charlottesville. Um, like I said, this is our first time back in person. So uh, just thank you. Thanks for being here. So welcome. Um, as you saw, we, we like our goofy things out there, so we've got Tubi out there to welcome you here. Um, and I also wanted to extend my welcome as well. So if you're unfamiliar with Creative Mornings, we're in 223 chapters across the globe, 67 cities, um, plenty of attendees per month, over 20,000, um, lots of talks online, and a lot of you, so we're really out there, we're really prolific, um, and it's a great thing to bring here to Charlottesville. So this month's theme is now. Um, how many of you said, right now I would like more sleep? Cool. Coffee? Cool. Uh, time outside? Okay, good weather. I know there's a good weather in here. Um, what about more time to work? Did anybody say that? Okay, good. We're all here. Um, so yeah, today's, today's all about now. So we always like to thank our sponsors, both local and global. So our global sponsor is MailChimp. MailChimp and Co's benchmark report is live this year. Uh, more than 2,000 freelancers, 63 agencies provided insights into how to win more business, find and retain top talent, mitigate risk, and improve performance. Um, these insights and inspiration can be delivered directly to your inbox, and you can go to their website to sign up. We also want to thank our local sponsors, some of which are in the room with us today. So Worth Higgins & Associates, Ting, The Fralin, UVA Arts, The Bridge, which we're here, and New City Arts. So thank you all. And we have someone to thank Marley. So thank you, Marley. Marley's in the back. Thank you to Jacob Cannon behind the camera there. And thank you to Lone Light, not here, but we thank you for coffee. And Bowerbird for pastries. All right. Now for what we've all come here for, um, I will welcome Alex Christie to the stage by reading his bio first. Alex Christie makes acoustic music, electronic music, and intermedia art in many forms. His work has been called vibrant, interesting I guess, and responsible for ruining my day. He has collaborated with artists in a variety of fields and is particularly interested in the design of power structures, systems of interference, absurdist bureaucracy, and interdeterminacy in composition. He is currently based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Recently, Alex's work has explored the ecology of performance in intermedia art and interactive electronic music. Through real-time audio processing, instrument building, light, video, and theater, Alex expands performance environments to offer multiple lenses through which the audience can experience the work. Alex has performed and presented at a variety of conferences and festivals whose acronyms combine to spell Nice den sauce is free, fog as cab slot north. Alex serves as faculty director of electronic music, director of composers forums, and academic dean at the Walden School of Music, Young Musicians, uh, Young Musicians Program. He holds degrees from the Oberlin Conservatory and Mills College and is currently pursuing a PhD in composition and computer technologies at the University of Virginia at the University of Virginia as a Jefferson Fellow. Other interests include baseball and geometric shapes. So please join me in welcoming Alex. Um, nailed that acronym. <laughs> I practiced. Yeah, I don't think I've ever even read it out loud. I forgot to update my bio, so should, I should clarify that the real director of composers forums at the Walden School is over there in the audience, and um, I, I uh, was, I'm no longer the director of composers forums. We can tell you the whole story later. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks again, Corey, for inviting me to this, and Alan. Uh, this is really exciting. I, I, I love doing this stuff. I, um, I love mornings, but it's really hard for me to get there, so this is really, this is, uh, I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Um, 
I have some more things to say about the, the bridge in particular, in particular that will come up in this presentation a little bit more organically, but I also want to thank the bridge for uh, being here. Everything you see on the table, I think, was first debuted at the bridge here in some form. So I'm, I'm here with you this morning, and thank you for being here, um, to talk about now and how now relates to my creative practice. And my creative practice is multifaceted, and the idea of multifaceted things will be a theme throughout this uh, morning. Um, so the, if, if I were to give this presentation a title, I might call it, uh, oops, I, I spoiled the surprise. I might call it Charlottesville Creative Mornings now and have the date here. But the secret title of this and the, pretty much the secret title of everything I do is composing as constellation. So as Corey mentioned, I'm a composer of various music and intermedia art. But um, the term composer it, it can be like a little distressing or confusing. Um, it can be a little gatekeeping, um, depending on who's saying it and in what context. Uh, so I want to first just address the idea of composition and composing as pretty much being anything, like your interaction with whatever you want in any part of your life, in any sphere. And open definitions like that will also be a theme of this presentation. So composing is composition. Um, what is it that I do, first of all? Uh, I make intermedia art. I build instruments. I'm an improviser. And I'm, I'm interested in creating situations in which media collide and there's improvisation and a lot of the situation is unknown. So I'm really interested in, in performing and composing pieces that are different every time. Uh, so I'm not as interested in like the sort of classical model of strict composition where everything is realized in a very precise way that's dictated by a person. I'm interested in interactivity and surprise and unexpected interactions. And one of the ways that I, or two of the ways that I try to achieve this are through improvisation and through thinking about agency and the idea that non-human things have agency. And when I say agency, I really just mean the ability to affect one's environment. So the idea that you know, agency isn't just something that's possessed by humans or, or, or biological creatures, it's possessed by spaces and communities and chessboards and um, the weather and the climate and small things too. You know, it could be any single thing in the world has agency because it affects its environment in some way or asks us to interact with it in some way. So that's what most of the stuff I do is about. It's about recognizing and, and um, elevating the agency of non-human things. And then that creates situations for interactivity and surprise, because we don't know that much about everything. So when we let everything speak in its own way, we can discover interesting interactions. Um, so I think actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a quick excerpt of one of my pieces that sort of demonstrates this all at once. I'm not going to do it live. I'll do the live thing later. And, uh, uh, maybe that will create some sort of frame for us to talk about. And I should actually give a flashing light warning for, I should just like have a button that says flashing light warning on me because that happens a lot. So later there'll be some strobe lights and there's some flashing lights in this video that I'm about to show you. We can listen to Coltrane later if you want. Um, so this is a piece of mine called System Block Signal Block System. It's for an array of electronic instruments and um, light bulbs and I'll just play some of it. That's a nice gross place to stop for now. Um, I'll just, just gonna play an excerpt. So what you're seeing here is, is an interaction between me and an array of electronics. And those electronics have the ability to 
disable my control of making sound, and I have the ability to make sound sometimes, and there's this give and take, this push and pull between my computer cutting off my performance situation. So this, this leads me to like the theme of what we're talking about today, to now, and how we can think about now. So this is one way that I think about now in my performance practice, which is what is happening now and what now is, and making that unexpected and new in every single now that happens within a performance. And I'll talk about that more in a second, but I want to sort of establish the way I think about now, um, right now. So I want to, I'm going to maybe turn this way a little bit. I want to break um, now down into two different types of now. The, maybe you can read that, maybe not. The first one is now number one, which is the process of composition for me. And again, composition can be anything. So I encourage you to, to, to think about what composition is for you when I talk about this. So I think we tend to think about time in this way, right? The past happens, and then the present happens, and then the future happens. And they flow together in this linear way. At least that's what's my, been my experience, kind of in most of my life. I'm gonna change I'm gonna change present to now just because that's the theme and it is a little bit different from what present means. So when we're composing a piece of music or I'm just gonna do this um, or anything, uh, we, we tend to think that we're we're working in now, right? When I'm doing something, I'm doing it right now. Uh, but the truth of the matter is the past really informs now. Right? Everything we've ever experienced, every history we've had with anything we've come in contact with is informing what we do right now, especially when you're making a piece of art or composing anything. So it's also fair to say that when we're in, the, in now making something, we are also making something based on the past, right? And what that means to me is that, especially since now becomes the past as time passes, uh, now and the past just inform each other in different ways. My history has informed what I'm doing now, composing a piece of music, and what I'm doing now will become the history and inform now later on. Okay, so, right, great, whatever. Um, the same is true of, of the future. We think about now as affecting the future, right? Everything that we do will have an impact later on. But also, we have imagined futures. We all imagine what the future wants, like, should be and what we want it to be for ourselves. And when we're composing something or making a piece of art or composing anything, we're first imagining its existence. We're manifesting it in our imagined future. And to me, that means that that future is affecting now how we choose to compose. Does that make any sense? Is that good so far? So, so what this really means to me is that like now is connected to everything and maybe is everything and everything is everything and nothing at the same time. Is anyone into um, is anyone into tarot? Tarot? Yeah, the zeros in tarot are everything and nothing at the same time. Um, I'm new to it, so maybe I'm wrong. So, but let's get to the point here. So I prefer to think of it this way, right? Let's not let's not put it in some linear order because linearity implies hierarchy. Um, but instead, we can just think of these three things, the now, the past, and the future, as being present and informing each other all the same t at the same time. And perhaps this makes more sense if we stop thinking about it as time and start thinking about it as space, where now is a space, the past is a space, and the future is a space. And we're actually able to move between those spaces as, a, 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 as freely as we like. And those spaces inform each other. And maybe we're in those spaces simultaneously. I like to think of time as space because then it gives me a little bit more um, agency to move and interact with the things in those spaces. So this is how I think about time. And, and notice that like, well, here's, here's, here's the, here's the punchline is that once we start figuring things in this way in more like geometric ways, we can just keep expanding and I can put myself here, the human in this, in this figure. And now I'm in contact with the past, um, now and the future all at the same time. And so like what now is kind of just bleeds into everything and we don't have to be worried about strict definitions. So there are a lot of ways we could talk about this, right? This type of figure, we could talk about it in like mathematical ways, we could talk about it in network ways. Um, all of those are legitimate and I really enjoy them. But I particularly enjoy talking about this as constellation. The idea that it's a constellation of different things that all affect each other and interact with each other. So when I'm making a piece of music, I'm part of a constellation, and I'm just one part of that constellation. And what's cool about constellations is they change over time. They change based on where you are. You know, um, the constellations and the stars look different from different galaxies and different perspectives, right? Um, and they're infinitely expandable. You can just keep putting 
putting actors and agents and actants into that constellation to expand it, and they all inform each other and create a richer constellation. So, pause. So basically, I, I think of time as space, and I think of space as time, I guess, and um, making these delineations isn't as helpful for me as doing the opposite, which is just like smearing them all together in like a fun, interactive constellation. So that's my creative process and how it relates to now, is that now is everything and also informed by everything else. So this is, this is the summary. I compose constellations of unique nows that are articulations of time and space. So meaning that the idea of now when I first started thinking about this was actually really anxiety inducing because the present is scary and we talk about it as being like, like infinitely small and always passing, like we're going to miss it. In the introduction, Corey, that you gave, some of, that was, was some of the themes were like everything's moving fast, like how can we grab onto now? Well, if now is space, then it's a lot easier for us to think about or a lot easier for me to think about. So. What you see here is going to be a performance soon. It's a constellation that will articulate the specific time and place that we're in, the now that we're in. Oh, I was going to put images there. I think I decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, we good so far on now? I promise to get to some more flashing lights soon. Um, so then there's now number two which is the performance, the thing that happens in real time, the thing that was planned and then executed in a way that doesn't always go according to plan. So I want to start with um, the, the same triangle and just swap out some of the, the stars in that constellation. So this is how I used to explain myself to people. I would say, I'm a composer, I'm a programmer, like making computer code. I used to do a lot of software instruments, build a lot of software instruments, and I'm a performer. You know, I've played saxophone and keyboard and um, electronic things. And I'd say all these identities inform each other. I believe this so much that I, I'm wearing long sleeves, but I got a tattoo of it that um, I can show you later. Uh, but the, the, I got kind of stuck with this because I felt like I was missing something. And eventually, I realized what I was missing was, was the agency of all the things I was talking about, where I was talking about me as the whole instead of me as part of a constellation. So reframing the performance practice as um, performing something that's a composition, an interactive system that's like the code or the circuitry, and the instrument, so the, the body of the things that are conveying information. So like now, now we have the idea of what the, um, the composition or the piece of art actually is. It's, again, a constellation of things that have agency, and once again, I can place myself in that constellation, and I'm not just talking about me. So what's important about this is the agency of these things mean that they're going to act in a certain way. So let's get kind of specific. Here's an instrument I built. It's a chessboard. Um, and then there's a, a synthesizer that I built into it. The synthesizer is built, so it's, it's unpredictable. It feeds back on itself, and it gets in the way of itself. And it allows for some human intervention. I can turn these chess pieces, flip these switches, and it will change something. But I don't know exactly what it's going to change. It's unpredictable. So it has agency, right? So that instrument is pushing on me, and I'm pushing on it in the act of performance. This megaphone's similar. It's a little bit more predictable, but it has light sensors on it, which means the architectural space is going to affect how it performs. And I have to like move, I'll demo it in a second, in order to interact with the light and the megaphone. So again, all these things are pushing on each other. And that leads us to another constellation. It leads, a, leads us to a constellation, oh, I lost my tag. Of, of media. So we also have the constellation of light and sound and architecture and sculpture and theater. And the way that these things act determine what happens now. And I don't know what's going to happen now in performance completely, ever. I, I, I stopped writing pieces where I know exactly what's going to happen. And the idea is that by thinking about performance as this constellation of nows, these these shifting nows, these moments of clarity within a constellation, allows us to engage with the world around us in more compelling and thoughtful ways. Because we realize that what happens now is determined by everything around us, the space and time that we're in, and how we think and act with everything um, in our world. The constellation of media. Are we good so far? Am I making any sense? I, I kind of sometimes feel like a crazy person being like, yeah, and cats are dogs, and what's it, burgers eat humans, and stuff like that. Um, 
I want to give you some more specific <laughs> examples. Uh, so this is a piece of mine called 27B stroke six. Anyone know the reference to that? For, for that it's making? It's Terry Gilliam's movie Brazil. Yeah, right. There's a piece of paperwork in Brazil that, that has as much agency, if not more agency, than the human actors in the situation. And it kind of represents the hyper-bureaucracy. So this is an 18-foot-long instrument that I built that performs the human. I try to play it, and it cuts off my controls, and these light bulbs light up, and it directs me to walk to the other end and do something. And then that breaks, and I have to walk back and forth always fixing this instrument and also trying to turn it off, but it, it, always, it always wins. I uh, will never perform this piece again because it it's, it's my favorite and least favorite piece that I've made at the same time. And here's um, a spooky picture of the piece I showed you earlier, System Block Signal Block System, which is similar to 27B stroke 6 in terms of the agency, but allows for a little bit more of a back and forth. And this piece is all about now because when the computer interferes, it grabs what I've been doing in my, in my now and loops it and sort of takes like what I was doing now and turns it into its own now and provides these moments of clarity where all of a sudden you, you like get what's going on and you're maybe more engaged than you were in the chaos and it's, it's articulating these points of time and space, these nows that are unpredictable and would be different every time that you saw the piece. And oh, and additionally, this one has light bulbs scattered all over, so the space is important, because, for example, if I were playing it here and there's a light bulb here, it casts the shadow, and maybe my movements would be accentu accentuated in that way. And then this is our friend up here that you'll see in a second. I already explained. There's unpredictability, but also some intervention. So again, these, these slices, these, these nows that are either constantly changing or are in their own constellation. And then the other thing about thinking about constellation is that we can create nows with other people, right? I, so far, I've only talked about myself and technology. But this is a collaboration I did with um, James Shoyan, who is at, at UVA um, and local photographer and filmmaker, where I was playing with feeding back old CRT televisions, and we turned it into a photo series. And um, what's great about this is this literally captures these moments that pass by. So we're freezing now in time because they flicker really fast. The, the, the TV is just like going and going and it's a little um, overwhelming. But here we can capture those moments and that happens through this constellation of collaborators and technology. So there we see one, we see like 16 slices of now, the now that was always changing and was unpredictable because of the agency of all these things. And then another collaboration, again, with uh, Kitty Cooper, who's the current director of Composers Forums at the Walden School. Um, this is our duo, Trash Cats. I think this picture was taken like right here. Um, and here we, we, we uh, perform exclusively structured or unstructured improvisation with technology that is unpredictable. So again, everything's in motion all the time, and it's all about the unexpected and how we can react and engage with that now. We also wear cat masks, because, I mean, I don't think I need to explain why. L look at that. Um, so that's the end of these slides. So I, I think the, the, the big things I, wanna I, I wanted to really hammer home is that to me, now is a space, or it's at least much a, as much a space as it is um, a moment in time. And the space and the time that it is is determined by everything in the universe and everything we interact with. And if we think, if we are thoughtful about how we interact with those things, if we recognize that everything around us has agency and identity and has qualities that affect the world around it and interface with you and everything else, if we recognize those things, we can, we can think more carefully about how we act now and what we're doing now and what now means to us on this localized level. We don't have to make it about the now of the universe because um, we have our own universe that we're always interacting with and now becomes um, immensely important in just how we are and how we be in time and space. So now of space helps me think about it in that way and helps me draw these constellations. Um, what I'd like to do now, it's like, well, <laughs> you can't, the word, I can't say a regular sentence without it sounding like now. Um, I, I've brought some of my homemade instruments here. Um, I usually perform in the dark. I'm also usually asleep 
right now. Um, but this is great. So a lot of these are, I say that because a lot of these are light sensitive and sort of inter interact with or um, respond to light. So they're going to be very different right now in this performance, which is kind of exciting and kind of the whole point of what I've been talking about. Um, this isn't a composition that I've really done before. This composition is a constellation of instruments and myself and y'all and the space around us. So I'll try to perform something. And then I would love if, I know we'll do like a question and answer, and I'll leave this set up if any of you want to come up and like play with it too. It's, you know, no experience necessary. So let me, give me a second to just change some things here and I'll get, I'll get cooking. Flashing light warning for this, so uh, there's some strobe lights.
So that one I've never done before. I mean, I've, I've played with those. So thank you for being here for that performance. And um, that's all I have for now. So I look forward to questions. All right, let's give Alex one more round of applause. Um, any questions? Immediately. Oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so you talk about how you build these instruments with inherent randomization in them. Um, and I'm curious if their agency is an element of that choice, shall we call it? Or uh, if the chessboard, for example, if it always responded the way that you knew it wanted it to, would that still have agency? Or is that more like an extension of the human note? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it would still have agency in a, a different form that's maybe not as potent, but still relevant, right? And and even just traditional musical instruments like a violin has agency, right? You have to learn about the pressure and the friction and the weight and how it touches your body. So I think it's the agency is already there. And yeah, so if I built it in a way where I knew exactly how it would work, that could still that could still function in a really compelling way in a constellation of things, right? So, and in fact, if something is completely random and something is completely fixed, that's a really interesting relationship to think about how they might interact and interface with each other. So yeah, um, and there, you know, it has behaviors that I'll recognize, and so I can I can get to places, but I I can't like drop into those places. Uh, so I think again, the agency is really important and could be anything because of its interaction with other um, parts of the constellation. Does that answer your question? Do I call her on them or do you call on them? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I hope the answer to this is no, but I can't help you about this while looking at all the wires. Um, have any of your instruments ever injured you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah um, almost. It happened right over there. Uh, I, so I, I do some pieces like the one, the video I played with the, the light bulbs turning on and off, and that's frequently computer controlled. So uh, years ago, I built a, a box of like relays that would let me interface with that. And I came close to, uh, it's not funny, I mean, it is and it isn't. I came close to electrocuting myself because I'm not an electrical engineer and I did something stupid. Um, so after that, I, I sort of bought some commercial hardware that that did that. But the building, it was fun. I mean, and, and honestly, it, like, um, this, these wires are totally safe. It all runs on nine volt batteries. Like, you you wouldn't even, you, the parts where you'd injure yourself would be in the construction if like, um, Jason Bennett, who runs one of the makerspaces at UVA, always says the most dangerous tool in the makerspace is an X-Acto knife or a box cutter, right? Because you slip, you know. So this stuff is totally safe. But uh, that was a good lesson for me to not play with the mains power. And I just shouldn't be sticking my nose where it doesn't belong. Although I would say um, a friend of mine from years ago named Dustin Schultz is a composer and sound sculptor and, and does a lot of the, I think recently he was doing um, costumes and set design for the band Skinny Puppy. Um, and he builds these wonderful, he's into suspension too, these sculptures that have like spinning fan blades and like jagged metal parts and they rotate and make sound and he has to like engage with it. So there are people who do this stuff to that level, but I'm not interested in, in that level of danger. <laughs> Unpredictability is great, but like danger scares me. Yes. Hey, um, thanks so much. This is so nice. Um, I'm curious about like um, you talked about you know you make instruments um, and you're you know, taking some existing components you know or like a megaphone or a computer and all these things and you're you're kind of re relating you know different parts of them to each other. How like that process does it? How, do, how, how does that process tend to unfold for you, or is it different every time? Like, like it's a lot of experimentation, a lot of, uh, or how do you get an idea for an instrument, I guess is kind of the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it, it, part of it relates to the, the constellation of now, past, future, and, and of me, where um, 
a, a lot of it is community, right? Like hanging out with artists who are doing interesting things and we share ideas and, you know, it gets me thinking about like, oh, what could I, what could I do? So like that past stuff informs what I think about and then um, imagining how I want something to happen in the future informs that. So there are things like um, thinking about the affordances of different objects. So for example, the megaphone is really cool as an electronic music instrument because it doesn't have to plug into a sound system, which means, okay, I can swing it around. I can walk through the space um, with it and hold it. And that's kind of where this came from. And I was like, okay, if I can move this thing, this like its, its own built-in electronic music instrument, what if I attach a synthesizer to it? I was like, okay, what if it responds to light? So because I'm moving it, it gives me the opportunity to interact with these other things. So I think like objects have, like again, they have their agency and they have their affordances. So sort of seeing what, what they already are and the ways that their actions could speak differently is part of that. So the, the chessboard, um, there's a, a I, I sort of remembered this. I'm sure this happens to all artists. I remembered a piece that already uses a chessboard halfway through making this thing. I was like, ah, um, which is much more complicated where you can play chess and it makes sounds. But I was interested in something that sort of had this classic synthesizer feel where there are knobs and switches. And um, I built this during like the height of the pandemic, during like lockdown when I was playing a lot of online chess. So I was thinking about like, oh, um, like, what if the motion of the chess pieces made a sound? And I was also thinking about um, the history of artificial intelligence and machine learning and chess is very similar to um, electronic music and being like, okay, what if I, instead of like having a supercomputer play chess, what if I made one that was like very blunt and like analog circuitry? So those are the things that, that I think about, like um, the affordances of, of of objects, you know, this is a distortion pedal that I just put into a book, um, and it's an old book about like a uh, electronic sound, and then also um, um, just sort of the interaction of media, like sound and space and light like that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Anyone more? Yeah, I think this is going to be complicated, but I'll try to be concise. Um, so, how do you hold yourself accountable for? really um, recognizing the unique agency of the different elements within your compositions. You, you mentioned pot potency, and potency is largely derived from like an element of surprise. You uh, talked about the chessboard, how you may not be able to like discern the, like, the exact pattern. You can get close to it, but even through that recognition of like, okay, I kind of understand what's happening, like a pattern begins to form, and so like you begin to understand more completely how you can influence that agency. I mean, like a sunrise, it's always unique, um, and so it has a lot of potency, but the, the bird that chirps every morning at five o'clock in the morning, like the, the, the potency kind of diminishes and takes on a different connotation. So is it through machine learning or like adding different sensors or how do you keep that element of uh, potency? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... It's not through machine learning. Um, it, I, I, I say that not to bash machine learning, but um, in like sort of my field of academic electronic music, that is definitely something that people focus on, and I just happen not to. Um, I, I think this is an answer to your question. I th think that by outputting a bunch of different media, so sound and light and theater, sometimes even costume, the architecture of the space, by outputting a ton of stuff at once, I hope that the interactions that emerge are unique to that time and space, to that now, right? And they will be similar, but sometimes they might also, there might be these drastically different moments. And I hope what the audience experiences are moments of clarity, which are the now moments, where maybe things sync up in a way that really resonates with them, so it makes sense um, on their terms. So, so maybe my answer has two parts. One is just by, um, kind of doing the same, so people are, like a lot of computer-driven music is interested in modeling emergence, the emergence of like biological systems and ecosystems. And I'm interested in just sort of shoving all this stuff into physical space and letting emergence happen there. And the emergence is partly derived by the, um, um, the agency of these things. And they mix together and have moments of clarity that the audience experiences. So I think that's, that's my answer, and some of it is also pushing some of that responsibility onto the audience um, where in, in hopefully in an inviting way where it's like do what you will interpret what you will with this stuff it has meaning to me hopefully some of that translates to you but also i'm just hoping that something emerges in the space that you can engage with does that make does that make sense yeah oh, 
Uh, okay, so I, I'm kind of curious about the aesthetic side of what you're doing. Um, like, I can see this Terry Gilliam's guess of wires and you know, kind of crazy um, bunches of things, but it's, it's also kind of, uh, I just wonder if you can talk a little about choice of materials and if there's, is that just an emergent thing that's coming out of what you're doing or is there um, an aesthetic side from the beginning? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think y yes to both and so for example, I, I wouldn't use my laptop with this because I feel like the aesthetic doesn't match. Um, Sometimes I do, but for this performance, I was like, I want to just have it be the homemade stuff, and as a result, the wires are going to be everywhere. And because you know these strobe lights are affecting sound, it makes sense for me to sort of be messy and have things in the way. So when I move them or reach for something, there's um, a reaction. I think um, I, I like I, I like that the book and the chessboard, and to a certain degree, the megaphone could be something else. Like this could be a set for like a some weird Beckett play. Right, and like, and it's they're there, and they have some weird, ghostly meaning that that is theatrical. So that's part of the aesthetic is that I like building instruments into things that already have some personality, um, and as a result, I don't really want it to be clean because I want you to see the like retrofitting, and I want you to see that there's something else happening about it. I want it to be exposed. Um, however, so for the like twenty-seven B, the the really long instrument. In that case, I wanted to hide the wires because the theater there was supposed to be like there's this like bureaucratic machine that like I just have to work for like I, I'm it's my boss right so it was supposed to be a little cleaner and 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 simpler um, so the aesthetic kind of depends on the piece and the performance but I do tend to this side it also kind of gives me the excuse to be messy in my improvisation or not the excuse but like the foundation to be messy and I I kind of like that you know I'm not. I'm no longer interested in virtuosity. I'm no longer interested in trying to like prove that I'm a good musician or that this is a good instrument or that I'm like creating something new. And as a result, I kind of like the messy spaces where there's more room to move and you can make mistakes and it can like maybe like stumble and like sound bad for a second and then maybe it picks up and feels more real in that way. Does that answer your question? Uh, so I find it really fascinating and impressive the way that you translate these concepts of relationships between space and time into an auditory language. And I think you're really successful at that, like orientation into a tone or interaction between elements into a different tone. Um, and it's very telling that my discomfort with the music feels very similar to my discomfort in the ever-changing now, right? <laughs> so, um, but as a visual artist, I work with similar themes and it's often a struggle for me to get that translation right. So I'm curious about the balance for you, like how often are you hunting for a particular translation, for a particular relationship, and how much of it is just like play what if? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do both of those things. The, the playing what if, I mean, just happened right now, you know, um, in performance. Um, and and that is the 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 now space that I'm that I'm trying to get at in this presentation, and then the the hunting happens as in like a different part of that constellation and sort of the instrument design part, um, and again which is connected to everything. So the hunting will be as, you know, unartistic as reading circuit diagrams of other people's synthesizers and figuring out how they interact. It's like oh okay that's interesting maybe I could use that but modify it or just use it as is. And so the hunting for interactions is, um, again, l looking at these objects, and these objects including like the, the little chips in these synthesizer circuits, and figuring out what their affordances are, what, how they already speak, and thinking like, how could that happen in there? So that's kind of in the, the process now, right? Where the future and past are all informing each other. And then the, um, what, do you, what do you call it? I really like that. Oh, the playing what if happens in sort of, Performance, whether it's public or you know, in my messy room where I'm like waving a megaphone around and, and light bulbs, and they they are like different. You know, it's a different mode of working, but they are connected in that way. So I do both, and I think, um, 
you know, as a composer, I still write notes on paper occasionally, but most of my compositional activity is the hunting that you describe, hunting for interactions. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Uh, so that's going to conclude us for today. Um, are you still planning on hanging out here and letting folks play yeah, with? Right yeah. yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Cool. So you're <laughs> free to come up here and try some things out. I have questions myself. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming back to our first in-person event in two years. Um, please take pastries with you and coffee on your way out. Um, and mugs. Don't forget the mugs. Take the mugs. And we will see you in June. All right. Bye. <laughs>